Cheers. Welcome to Nerdist Book Club, live on Nerdist and Geek and Sundry's YouTube and Geek and Sundry's Twitch. I'm Rachel Hine. I'm the editor-in-chief at Nerdist. Uh, big fan of wine, big fan of books, and joining me as always are my fellow fans of those two things, Geek Bomb's Maud Garrett. Yay! And you see Daily. You just, <laughs> did you spill that on electronics, Maud? On my phone, on my laptop. Clean it right <laughs> now. That is stressing me out. right now. Just clean on my it. dress. Clean that is, it. Yeah. Clean it up. Can, yeah. Can, cut can, away from me. Cut away from me for a Stephen, second. our producer is trying yeah, to give her napkins through the. That's great. I did that the other day. I did that last week. Uh, we were watching a movie, and I moved a PlayStation controller, which also controls the Blu-ray player, mm -hmm. right? The controller, but it was plugged in because it was charging, and I literally spilled a glass like this full of wine on no. our coffee table. And I was so stressed and I felt so, so bad. And right now I'm stalling and stalling and stalling. Yeah, so that my totally. Yeah, we, we're, we're taking our time, checking <laughs> in with the chat. We're gonna get, we're talking about Dune, but we're gonna get into it. Um, Hector, do you wanna do the thing? The, what, what thing? The thing. <laughs> Never mind. What thing? I'll, I'll make it more, more organic. Yeah, uh, the thing, the, the joke I said earlier, not the joke, but just like, I don't know, I liked your little impression. Anyway, we're <laughs> live. This is how the show goes. Um, I'm Rachel. You guys know Maude and Hector. Maude is Hi. furiously scrubbing wine off her uh, electronics and stuff like we're that. We're so and good. A little bit of TP to the rescue. What? Great. Amazing. Mm -hmm. Here we are. How are you guys doing? Hi. Great. I'm great. So good. Um, I remember last week I predicted that the second half of books, uh, the books are usually a little bit more action packed than the first mm -hmm. half. This one just seemed like it was gladiator ready. <laughs> hmm. Yeah, I, w I definitely want to get y'all's thoughts because um, I feel like it, it was definitely slower, um, but a lot happened character wise. So, um, but before we dig into all that, I wanted to say, hi, welcome to everyone. Uh, if you're just joining us, this is Nerdist Book Club. It's exactly what it sounds like. It is an online book club where you are part of the conversation uh, in the chat on Goodreads, the after show, which we'll tell you about, which is on Geek Bomb right after this, um, tweeting at us, Facebook. I've been getting like Instagram DMs about, you know, Dune and the show. It's really all very appropriate um and it's really <laughs> fun to talk about oh no this book with you wow Oop. so Oop. Pe so people are sliding into your dms rachel and they're like hey i want to talk about the ma dib and you're like cool yes <laughs> what you doing my light just <laughs> where else? this is great really where are you really going hey i want to shout out to this wine since it's i've become i've won Thank with you. the wine um i was doing some free pouring into my glass and spilled a little bit, but that's because I love wine and we have really cool refreshments happening. These beverages that were sent in by the Hideaway Wine Company, which is super great. Hector and I finally lined up our um, palettes, our taste choices. Boom. We are drinking the 2014 GSM, which is 30% Grenache, 40% 40 Syrah and 30% you probably should have looked at that before you attempted to read it. Yeah, yeah. Very French more word. More Very vegan, right? delicious word. It's a French word. It starts more with an M. And the important thing is that this wine is called uh, private office is what it's You guys called. are literally in my private office right now. So exactly. Mm, and, and I do want to point out like it. Yeah, I, I do want to point out it is a tradition on our show for one of us to spill the wine. Yes. And I'm just kind of happy it wasn't me for the first know, time ever, I, I feel like. I spilled the wine in my <laughs> private office, on my <laughs> private office, with the private office. <laughs> yeah, Hector, I feel like you have the most um, spills mm -hmm. under your belt in terms of book club. I and definitely do. I'm drinking the 50-50 uh, Equality that has a lovely picture of like catacombs on it, which also mm -hmm. looks like a pattern I downloaded for my Animal Crossing Island. <laughs> um, this one's a 2016 Cabernet Sauvignon and Syrah blend from Santa Barbara County. And you can get this wine if you are over the age of 21 in the U.S. of legal drinking age. Be responsible um, at the Hideaway Wine Company. You can go to uh, thehideawaylo.com to order wine from them or even join their wine club. So and if guys, you they're like local as well. Wine, 
yeah if you're in california it is a local wine so buy local because it's good to support local business especially in this time yeah absolutely delivers to your house delivers to your house dude i oh my gosh uh fulano did did Telfe says wine must flow and wine then, must honestly, flow it, it should be our new um one of our new book bits and who that. controls the wine <laughs> controls so, the world <laughs> yeah well i mean ooh, i i want to get into this section of the book too because um i feel like a lot happens with jessica with gender mm. with romance i'm sliding sorry um and it's not as bombastic as the previous uh, sections necessarily, or the second half of the first book in this series. Which is still but, my favorite. Yeah, so far that's my favorite too. I don't, this one isn't my fave, but I do like a lot of the character moments in this and a lot of the themes from the book uh, come through in here. So um, before we get going, I just wanna say the Game Wizard 001 says this is why i prefer bottled soda with a cap more difficult to spill lol but spill then also the follow it up yeah is the buzz killer and paul robertson says i am drinking the cocktail i made for the show which is the uh, kizatz sazerac oh okay the second part i know <laughs> kizatz i was thinking about the sazerac? actual name from the sazerac? book like it's a sazerac which is a cocktail but i was so focused on getting the actual name from the book right that I you know it's cool it's all um, good reading dojo kiwi by the way said that I was just pouring one out for our mate kinds you go Liet kinds mm, yeah mm -hmm. oh, r.i.p kinds r.i.p kinds um he was a good man he was kinds shit <laughs> <laughs> our yes. producer was like whoo <laughs> Um, never be sorry. <laughs> never apologize for puns. Puns are well, that one of the bizarre. many. I want to be proud of it. In the melange, I'm sorry of book club. Okay, so where were we before? Yeah. Previously on this section. Pre oh wait, Hector. Previously Hector. on June. That's good. That sounds good. We'll we'll stick with that. That's a good one. Uh, so. We finally finished book two of Dune, uh, which to clarify is book within a book, not in the series. We're still on main Dune. Um, so Paul has gone on an intense journey up to this point of a harsh new planet full of danger and intrigue. Um, after moving to Arrakis to take over production of the universe's most priceless commodity, the Atreides family uh, is betrayed and destroyed by the villainous Harkonnens who are secretly backed by the emperor. As Paul and Jessica struggle to survive on the run in the desert, he has an awakening. Picture like that's so Raven eyes. Um, uh, and, oh, sorry, I lost my place. So as, uh, well, so we said Liette Kynes died, uh, which is important, but I yeah. kind of wanted to talk about that before we dive into this section because there's, there's that scene where he's kind of, you know, trudging through the desert. He doesn't have a still suit. He's about to get exploded mm -hmm. uh, by the, the spice. And his, you know, Forest Ghost Papa appears to him to explain, it's basically memories of him teaching when he was younger. But what I really liked is this quote about how they could turn Arrakis into an Eden and how to get the Fremen and the people of Arrakis on their side. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm just going to read a quick quote, quote, religion and law among our masses must be one and the same, his father said. An act of disobedience must be a sin and require religious penalties. This will have the dual benefit of bringing both greater obedience and greater bravery. We must depend not so much on the bravery of individuals, you see, as upon the bravery of a whole population. And so as we're getting into this section, I wanted to see where you are all at in terms of you know one of the main themes of this book is power and control but this really a, a sub focus is using religion as means of control right and benny jesserit sort of planting these false prophecies all over the the universe to sort of make sure that no matter where a benny jesserit lands she will have loyalty she will find safety and allies um, and we also have Paul's ascension to become Muad'Dib, which we know has the potential to 
start a jihad in this sort of horrible war. Everything, he has these options, none of them end well. They're all very, you know, violent and bloody. And, you know, what do you, what do you guys think about the prophecies and religion as control? And do you buy into, at this point in the book, any of the prophecies? Or do you think that, you know, I think I think that Frank Herbert was trying to say about religion is that it does control people. It does shift how people think about things. And I think especially with the section that you read, Rachel, where uh, um, uh, I want to call him Liette, but uh, where Kynes' force ghost father showed up and talked about environmentalism and talked about all of the science behind the planet. I think Frank Herbert is trying to say that the way that you're gonna get people to shift their focus and look at environmentalism and look at protecting nature and look at protecting the environment and protecting the planet is, it, is to tie that into religious belief because perhaps religious belief uh, shapes how people act in their lives, how people vote, how people respond to the modern world. And if part of that religious belief is, is um, taking care of the environment then maybe frank herbert's message of like we should take care of this planet would uh would 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 be more like uh, reinforced as for the question do we believe in the prophecy it's interesting and i want to use a different phrase because our mutual friend kyle anderson was talking about how he hates the phrase have your cake and eat it too because people use it incorrectly all the time so i need another phrase but i feel this is like a help me out it's almost like a schrodinger's cat because frank herbert has been telling us these characters have planted these prophecies and yet- self prophecy, it's what I've been saying from the start. Self-fulfilling. You're manifesting yeah. it. So if you keep it's drilling nuts. in the point that this could happen, yeah. Um, when paths are presented, paths are going to choose the the way that goes towards the prophecy. But that um, phrase- Even if self it's based on a lie, it's it will be manifested into a truth eventually if you keep pushing along. So it's line. still a truth. A self-fulfilling prophecy is not like a cynical phrase. It still means the prophecy is real. It just started the way that it started. That's what you're saying, right, Ma? That like, it, we should still take this as like a legit if you, prophecy. If you keep saying something's going to happen, mm -hmm. eventually that will come into effect because you continually put it out into the universe. Like yeah. that is a premise of manifesting how people kind of like want to fulfill personal goals. But in the Bene Gesserit sense, it is projecting all of these prophecies that eventually the piece of that particular puzzle will fit into place, but it's amplified by the fact that people are waiting and believing and um, mm. are going to see the signs align for this prophecy, prophecy to come into effect. So Paul may ne not necessarily be a chosen one at all, but the right place at the right time with the amount of inundation of information coming from Ooh. multiple vegetables means that he's going to step up and take the crown in that regard. Was I Harry have Potter? a few thoughts about this though, if Ooh. I may. Yeah. Please. All right. So as far as religion goes, the Bene Gesserit here are super manipulative. They are literally trying to control things and place their own destiny onto yeah. situations, onto groups, and onto into different planets. For survival. Like too. create a gene, like a new gene pool for the universe. Yeah. Like, so selective and breeding. And right. Initially, yeah, I was like, not, that's a bit of a puppet master kind of thing. But then I realized, mm, and it was very apparent to me in this particular book when we met the Fremens that the it's still a patriarchy. And when we talk about control, the control always lies with the men because the man uses a physicality for power. So the Bene Gesserit have to use mind and their mm -hmm. smarts and you know, emotions to have their sort of control. And this is where the yin and yang comes back into effect. So I actually admire the Bene Gesserit for being able to use that manipulation because that is their strength. And time and time again, we see Jessica be like, wow, they are saving me. Wow, the Michiana, yeah. Michiaria, whatever. Um, you know, they have laid down this path in the foundation so I can pick up where they left off. And I really yeah. admire that. And my God, if Stilgar calls Jessica woman one more time. <laughs> okay, but here's the thing. Remember how we talked about how the only person who could get away with being Duke Leto is Oscar Isaac and not even marrying Jessica. We're like, I'd still be with Oscar Isaac. Yeah. Keep in mind, Stilgar is gonna be played by Javier Bardem. Yeah. So can you imagine Javier Bardem's sexy yeah. accent saying, yes. Woman. I ship it. I I'm ship like, it. Bored. I'm but like, here I am, like listening to it, where I was like, learn yeah. her name, <laughs> write her name. 
Question. But then he creates his own name for her. And I was like, eh, okay. Yeah. But then I, with the the way that women are treated in the Fremens is very backwards. I've been yes. reading up on it and some people have used the word traditional. And I don't <laughs> even like the fact that traditional is a way no. to describe backwards. it. backwards. Many, many, it's backwards and many uh, yeah. more ancient civilizations were actually matriarchies. So. Yeah, exactly. And, and you I love those moments in the book where Jessica will say something because she's just reacting in the moment. She'll be like, oh, so-and-so, so-and-so. And then Stilgar will be like, the prophecy, it is impossible. And then Jessica <laughs> thinks, holy shit, I'm so glad all these women aeons ago created this prophecy so that I would not die right now in this moment. And you're yeah. absolutely right, it's great. Yeah. And I love to, um, I was researching the, is it the orange? Catholic? Orange orange Catholic Bible? Yeah. The OC the Bible? Yeah, which is an, a combination of basically all of these different religions so that um, Frank Herbert can address, you know, there's Hinduism, Buddhism, Catholicism, there are all these different elements in, in there. And by combining them, um, he A, doesn't have to, you know, shout a particular one out or get into real world religion exactly, but he's right. going from all of them. Um, and I also think in terms of the prophecy, it's sort of a Sisyphean cycle, right? Like they're planting this prophecy and thank you. I really like that word. I'm um, drinking to that. I Good word. I finally have an excuse Damn. to use this word. Sisyphean? Anyone. My favorite word is Sisyphean. Um, but it is, it sort of self-perpetuates itself like Maude was saying where um, you, Paul, they assume that Paul, and we'll get into that also in this uh, this first section, but they assume that Paul or think he might be this chosen one in the Fremen, uh, you know, uh, religion and way of life, culture, but it takes a very different act and moment for them to accept him as their own, um, which I think is really interesting. It really has nothing to do outwardly with his powers um, and, and all the futures that he can see it's it's this different thing. So I what I really like about this as well is that you're seeing the differences between the Atreides and between the Emperor and the Harkonnens and the Fremens, which is your, I guess, royalty um, positions of stature versus your nomadic kind of groups. And that is how power is attained. Um, and why are you giggling, Hector? I read a great um, comment, but keep, keep going because oh. you were making a good point and I didn't want to interrupt. <laughs> so Paul got into a position of power just by being born. He's sort yeah. of earned it and he's learned a lot um, and because his parents have made sure that he's equipped with a lot of, you know, knowledge and skills to be able to be a successful Duke. But the Fremen- to to private school. He gets to go to like one-on-one yeah. -on -one private school tutor, That's which it. is not to knock anyone that has- But it's a super power. easy way to oh, sure. progress oh, yourself. Sure. Yeah. Um, whereas the Fremen, again, it's like- <laughs> that kind of alpha male thing where it's if you're the strongest then you will lead um and it's so interesting to see how different duke leto and paul and the baron and the emperor and also stilgar and um kinds liet here showcase their leadership qualities and how they sort of use leadership traits to gain respect um and i think it's quite quite interesting here that you see Jessica and um, Paul who have absolutely nailed this whole um, leadership and the qualities that they have and the skill sets that they've learned through the Bene Gesserit and through the Mentat, um, which we saw in that gorgeous dinner table scene. But they are such a fish out of water because <laughs> there is no water um, okay. but in, in the Fremens <laughs> at the moment. And so they have to readjust and they have to relearn everything and they are not equipped with the skill sets to be able to kind of commandeer this. I found this to be incredibly relatable because um, I never knew an outside perspective when I was living in Australia. But then as soon as I moved to America, I was inundated with different perspectives. And a lot of these perspectives I have learned through our book club that we've been doing because I didn't even know that your parents still being together was a form of privilege. You know, like <laughs> there's just so many things that I've been learning. And if so I kind of, <laughs> what? If they still get along, some, some stated. That's true. But, a great, but totally, there's all sorts yeah. of um, perspectives and that's one of my favorite things about the show too is getting everyone's insight. Hector, can you read the uh, the comment that made Would love to. <laughs> Here's a comment that made me giggle. I was talking about Kyle Anderson and he hates have your cake and eat it too. I said, I need a new phrase. 
And Cole underscore Drake said, have your spice and eat it too. <laughs> sure, <laughs> we'll do that. Right. Uh, but, there's, but there's a great conversation happening about the prophecies. Miss Necromancer says they are all self-fulfilling prophecies in a way. It doesn't matter if they're actually real or Paul is the real savior. The belief that he is makes it true, even if it was originally yep. a lie. And Arcane Void says, hmm, whether the prophecies that were planted are false is really interesting. Um, Chaotic Looney says the Greeks have shown that trying to stop a prophecy will cause it to come true. I think it's all very interesting. And I feel like it also makes it so that when Frank Herbert's putting his story out there, it's up to the reader to interpret it. Because I feel like a cynical reader can read Dune and go, oh yeah, it's just the Genebezeret. It's just seeds planted. This is all BS. Wow, how clever. And people who would be more willing to accept actual like, you know, magic and telling the future fate? and fate can read Dune and go, oh, Dune's all about fate, man. Because Dune's you can all throw about- out all of yep. these prophecies all you like, but until they're aligned yep. and can fit sort of like the path, I guess. Because mm-hmm. I feel yeah, like- prob- This extreme probability of whether or not it can, all those things can align. Exactly. The planets yeah. align, you know, that kind of thing. But I it know doesn't- the chat has been split about it. So I kind of want to go over it again. It'd be cool to go to Paul, but I don't know if that's possible. But do you believe Ooh. Paul Muadib Atreides to, Ursu, to be the prophecy? Do you think that he is the chosen one? I'm going to say I would vote yes. Only because, like I said before, Dune is a fascinating read because I, I, I've been told that it's science fiction. It takes place 10,000 years in humans' future. And yet, and yet, it feels more like Lord of the Rings to me. It feels more like magic. It feels more like concepts and cultures and, and, and different rules of this world, including the, Genebez- the Bene Gesserit, including the, the, the prophecies that, you know, Paul's getting high on spice, spice itself. It's all sort of magic things that give people supernatural abilities and cool supernatural things in the story. So I feel like if this world has that, those things as part of its universe, why not a prophet? Like I'm, I am kind of buying into it. So I would say yes. I would say I'm, I'm sort of in the, not to be obnoxious, but like almost both, both where I think that- Ugh, obnoxious. I know, but you know, <laughs> I'm not giving a specific answer. Um, and, but I do think that he can become this figure through legend and through stories being told. And he obviously has these abilities. Um, and I will get into this later, but I'm also very interested in his as yet to be born sister. Mm. Um, extremely, that was at the last section of this part. I was like, this is Ooh. shit. Is yeah. she in another book? <laughs> I'm really excited to meet St. Alia. <laughs> yeah. Oh, here's another great comment I want to point out too. I said 10,000 years in our future, but our producer Steven said, it's year 10,000 in a calendar different than ours, according to our friend, Matt Karen, who's like the number one Dune head. Mm. So who knows how many years in reality, but if we extrapolate that and the orange Catholic Bible is also known as the OC Bible, we have to assume then that that Bible was written around the time that the show, the OC was on the air. So 2000, <laughs> so roughly still 10,000 years from now. 2003, don't yes. get me started on the OC because I have many thoughts. And from the tome Marissa of the yes. 12th year of yes. <laughs> That is indeed when Adam She was addicted to spice Brody. as well. <laughs> I know. Oh no, Maud. That was a storyline in the show. Um, <laughs> um, character. That, I, I stopped watching before, I stopped watching after like one or two seasons, but I did love oh, that show. I was like so team Seth. Right? Uh, Me too. But I was team Seth until he decided to go for Summer instead of that other woman who was clearly- uh, Anna. More, and Anna. we had more in common with, comic books, man. What are you yeah. doing? Mm. And then I was like, Seth, you suck, dude. Well, that's why the girls go for the douchebag assholes when they should be going for the nice guy because the guys go for Becky Bimbos and they should be going for the nice girls. Becky Bimbo, is that an Australian term? Becky Bimbos? I've never oh. heard that before. <laughs> it's amazing. It's new now. Uh, can I just to air some grievance as well with like, phrases that should be stamped out i don't know what happened in america but it is not i could care less because if you could care less you'd be doing it right you know it's I mean? like couldn't i couldn't care less, care less. I couldn't, yeah i mm-hmm. couldn't care less than what i'm caring about, right i feel this way too but i had to less the amount of people that say to me i could care less i'm like do it then 
Yeah, I care less. I could, no, which means that's I. Not, uh, yeah. I love what about what about I don't give a rat's ass. No one gives rats asses. No one's got a pocket full of rats asses to re ready to give. You don't know. There's some. I don't know. Strange people. Yeah. It's not me. Yeah. <laughs> oh no! There's what a Becky in the about? chat who's heard of Becky Bimbo before. I'm so oh, sorry, Becky. Sorry. <laughs> oh, but all sorry. Becky's are bimbos. But all. Karen's and Becky's are having a tough week. Uh, the other thing no, I love- they're not. Um, Ste no, they're fine. Steven said in the chat, uh, in the OC Bible, they celebrate Chrismica. Yes, they do. <laughs> oh my God, brilliant, brilliant, brilliant. Um, all right, let's dig into what actually happened on this book uh, in this section, rather. The second- Wait a minute, wait a minute. The 30 second TO, apparently that's not the full phrase, Maude. Marian just told us in the chat, the full phrase is, I could care oh. less, I would have to try. People yes. are just cutting off that second part, which is really mandatory if you're trying to make your point. That Seriously. sounds like the evolution of a phrase where it's been dropped. Because I actually think that my aunt says that now that I'm hearing I could, it. I could care less, but I have. It's like when yeah, people say, I when in try. Rome. I hear that in my head. When people say, when in Rome, we all know, do as the Romans do. So we could just kind of shorthand when and go, in when in Rome. And we all San go, San <laughs> Diego. San Diego. Well, agree to disagree. <laughs> no. Um, yeah, that's interesting. And please share your uh, linguistic frustration <laughs> in the chat because we're all there with you. I yeah. used to, I had a period in high school where I thought it was really fun and clever to like correct graffiti in bathrooms. Wow. You're oh, like a yeah. rebellious nerd. Wow. <laughs> That's exactly what I am. Well, You're I mean, like Bart as as and Lisa Simpson. Go, yeah. <laughs> if I get a comment where someone's like, you know, not being very nice and there's a spelling yeah. error in it. Oh, it yeah. Doesn't, your. It doesn't expect I know. I know. If you're not smart enough to spell the right your, then. I love that. Uh, actor Don Cheadle does that all the time. He gets a bunch of shit on Twitter and he'll be like, asterisk your with apostrophe <laughs> re. And it's like, that's Best all comeback. you have. Best Great. comeback. Yeah. <laughs> I love it. Yeah. All right, we're diving into it. Um, this is what happened in this section. So Paul and Jessica have a tense meeting with Stilgar and this sort of clash of cultures. We, I was expecting once, you know, that voice came out of the shadows that this was, okay, it's Fremen time. We're getting in with them. Yeah. So uh, yeah. while the Fremen are willing to save Paul um, as per Liet's orders, Jessica has to prove her worth and does so by besting Stilgar in a fight. So we touched on this a little bit, but Stilgar. I think, I do think that the culture is definitely um, much more uh, of a patriarchal sort of system. Which Backwards. Into, yes, yes, synonyms. Um, <laughs> oh no, you do. Um, <laughs> um, but uh, I do like that he is the first character even if he's calling her a woman, um, to really respect Jessica's power and wisdom more than anyone else. Even Leto a little bit, he didn't trust her to tell her what was going on. She could have clearly handled it and not given away that, you know, he was supposed to be suspecting her and creating that um, dynamic for whoever the spy was. Yeah. Um, and I just really like that he he seems very emotionally intelligent to even the conversations that they have later and how he introduces everyone. So I really like him within this framework and also super ship him and Jessica, just saying. Ooh, I, oh, I yeah. think that was a really interesting conversation that they had because he started flirting with her and then he was yep. like, we could, we could be a thing if you want. And then he was kind of like, well, actually, if I take you as another wife and I was like, uh, but another wife, then the men will start thinking that my priorities are nookie nookie mm -hmm. and not like leading. And, and he's Jessica thinking about like, her role too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. mm. uh, I really at the like same time, her, her choices are to wife or to be the religious sort of like reverend mother. And I'm yes. like, uh, uh. what a great commentary on female characters in general, Maud. You're either the, the, the love interest. Yeah. Or the mother. The witch. Had an amazing comment earlier that resonated. She goes, it was actually a bit of a bummer to meet Chaney 
and to instantly be able to see her only as the girlfriend character. Mm. Yeah. And I, I'm, I am excited to see for many reasons, the film, but I think that, you know, looking at Dune and some of the culture, cultural references and systems, A, thinking about them in context of the 60s, thinking about them in context of what these kinds of societies can be like. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm, I'm excited to see, you know, in the Vanity Fair uh, article, a sort of reveal of a lot of the characters and their costumes, which is super awesome. Um, they talk about the expanded role of women, not just casting uh, a black woman as Liette slash Kynes, right. but also expanding Jessica's role, expanding Chaney's role. Um, and- is it, is it Chaney or Chani? It's in the audiobook. it's Chaney. Chaney, okay, cool, yeah. okay. But- cool. I she think, like and, he's thinking about it, so and I might. think in the David Lynch film, it's Chani. I think, mm -hmm. and I'm forgetting the actress's name. The wonderful actress who was in Blade Runner, and she was oh in yes, Ace Ventura. Uh, she Virginia played, Madsen. She, she plays no, no, no. Virginia Madsen plays the princess who was oh, the right. narrator at the beginning. Yes. I don't remember. But it's the same actress who. Oh my gosh, I'm completely, completely blanking on her name. Somebody in the chat. Someone will, in the chat will help you out with that one. Yeah. Sean. 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 Her name was Sean. Uh, Sean Young, S-E-A-N, yeah. oh, yeah. Sean Young played again from Blade Runner. She was in the first Ace Ventura movie yes. in a real yes. problematic yes. role that we oh. can't really watch anymore, but Sean yep. Young, great actress. Um, and she played, uh, uh, and I think in the David Lynch film, they said Chani, but now we've got Lee in the chat telling us it's Chaney. And Chaney. our okay, lovely cool. producer, Steven also put up Chaney. Gotcha, so. cool, cool, cool. Yeah. Anyway, That's yeah, yeah. But yeah, I, I, We'll, we'll get into it. So, um, I will say far, though, with the introduction yeah. of the Fremen, I really found the, the switch in priorities to be incredibly uh, interesting. Currency is water. And if you break it down, like water is such an essential component to living. The fact that currency is what drives our world is really quite interesting when we're made up of 70% water. So when you, like the way that they discuss water, and it's interesting to see how Jessica is trying to, uh, absorb these new rules and regulations and um, you know cultural differences and it wasn't until uh, the what? And absorb. <laughs> nice. Thank you. Nice. Thank you. I feel like the Robert De Niro meme analyze this. You, <laughs> you with the puns. Um, but it was interesting that it's like you know straight away she's not seen as a living person and when you weigh up what is more important a life that you can rescue or to take their water from them to give to everyone else. Like it's it's the the worth that you have as a person, the fact that you're alive isn't enough. And I thought that that was really, really interesting. Yeah. Um, but then also when we move further into their culture and the, their death rights, I guess, in a way, um, mm -hmm. to see how water is extracted in that particular way and it, how it's weighed. And then you see Paul cry and the reaction that is um, you know given from that. And I'm, I'm trying to kind of learn why they're so void of emotion because when we do go to that combat where um uh, jamie Janus? 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 Janus. Janus. is killed and the the wife has no remorse she doesn't feel anything she's like i mourn when I, i'm supposed to but i'm not going to cry over this and how mm -hmm. it's just such a almost business-like um way of dealing with particular things they're just so void of emotion yeah. and again as a Bene Gesserit who really like studies emotions and can control emotions or can manipulate emotions to see that they have no emotions is really interesting as well yeah I really like the character of Stilgar I think that I was also informed while reading this section by the casting of Javier Bardem mm -hmm. and I can't, I can't remember the actor who played Stilgar in the David Lynch movie which I watched a few weeks ago but I have Javier I think so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think so. I have Javier Bardem rattling around in my brain. And the cool thing is, is that to me, Stilgar is like a bastard. He's like a real jerk sometimes, which I think Javier Bardem can do very, very well. I mean, he's played some very evil men as an actor. And yet what I love about Stilgar and Maude was saying this too, like the shift in priorities, Stilgar as a leader is all about the, tr the whole group, the whole tribe. Yeah the entirety of everybody and everybody has a role and everybody has a purpose. And, you know, it, it's sort of like, 
a bug's life or ants, like what's best for the for the colony is what's best mm -hmm. for, you know. So I that really enjoy you to save. Yeah. And it's and 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 anytime you read that and you go, man, that's kind of messed up. It's like you gotta remember these are people, the Fremen people who live in the desert in such a harsh, not just like earthly landscape, otherworldly harsh landscape that their whole thing is all about survival. They have beliefs, they have customs, they have school even, they're teaching kids. Mm -hmm. like and yet that. it's, it's yeah, it's all about survival. Yeah, Paul was like, you're teaching people even now? And, and the, the, the woman was like, we can't not, like, what are you talking about? It's, it, we the have reality to, of our existence, yo. It's all like. about survival. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I agree. And I also think that um, it ties into not to what you were saying earlier, Hector, about, um, you know, saving the world, saving the planet, environmentalism, where they're willing to fight and die to turn Arrakis into an Eden, into some place, and they're not going to live to see it. You know, that's for their future. And that's not only sort of, um, in, you know, extremely relevant in terms of climate change and saving yeah. our, I mean, our planet will be fine. Saving humanity, letting humanity, like, live yeah. on this planet and, and animals and nature and stuff yeah but like literally keeping it so that life can thrive here because the planet could burn up and still be like i'm fine but we'll you know but it's it's about choosing the good of um of the many over individualism and i think there's sort of a it's it's a double-edged sword because then you get into you know sort of uh almost like you don't matter at all, but there right. is this sort of delicate balance. But it also reminds me of right now where it's like, you just need to wear a mask and try to stay inside. No yeah. kidding. Yeah. And you, these- Well, actually a point that I'd like to add on to that is that when you have this Fremen makeup, it's that you're, the worth of an individual's life, as we were saying, isn't the priority, it's the group. And they were saying that what di the difference between a mob and a people is the fact that a people have a leader and a strong leader that can carry the people, whereas a mob are just chaos, basically. Um, but I'm noticing as well with not only Jameis, um, but with the the kamikaze uh, person from the last book, at uh, the end of last book mm -hmm. that we saw, is that the individual life, like it's not something that needs to be mourned and you're not making decisions based on personal survival. And I think that what's happening uh, as a consequence is that Without that mentality, you kind of eradicate selfish behavior. So there is no sense of selfishness. And I think the reason why, you know, this whole mask thing is that it's like, it's a personal attack on freedom. Whereas uh, in this regard, you know, like Jameis felt wronged and it was gonna cost him his life to be wrong. And that was kind of okay because it's like, he just had to make that stand. Um, but I just think it's really interesting, like the selflessness that we are seeing, but I guess selfishness is an emotion or a trait, and that seems to be stamped out of them learned. as well. Yeah. It's definitely yeah. learned, and um, but I, 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 I do love what Rachel said earlier, because what you just said, Rachel, made me sort of recontextualize the book in another way, which is, we know that Frank Herbert cares about the environment and, and, and was frustrated with where things were in the 60s. So he would probably be real pissed where things are today. Oh God, he'd be furious. But, I'm furious. But the way you described it made me realize that one of the themes that he injects in this story is that he does have people not care about their immediate future, but the future of the generations that will come after them. That yes. what they're willing to sacrifice now to ensure that Arrakis, the dune, the, the desert planet, dune, the desert planet, will become habitable and an Eden, and they won't even live to see it. And that, like, way of thinking, I think is is um, it can be pretty foreign to even like a Western way of thinking. Um, yeah. Jose uh, and Oliviera in the chat just said, uh, Maud, three words for the horde. And if you're a video game player at all, and it's that mentality where it's like you are part of, it's not necessarily a mob, it's more of a people because you're being led. But when you're being led into something, yeah, it does, if it costs you your life, but it's the betterment for everyone else, then that is the risk that you take. And that is almost an honor to be able to give your life in that particular way. Also, I play Alliance, so whatever. I, I also think that um, there's, 
there's a difference, not just in having a leader, because sometimes a mom can have a leader, um, but you know what I mean. But um, the, the idea that you are not sacrificing others for your own gain just because you want to get ahead. You know, the Baron is totally personal gain. Willing. It's personal well, gain. Completely. Exactly, for personal gain versus mm -hmm. they're coming at the Fremen they, who, this is their planet. This is where they lived. Everyone is coming in to just, you know, mine the planet for any resource that it has and fuck them or or kill them all they just don't care about them as a people they're not even taking them seriously which i can't wait to see just that, that yeah. <laughs> oh my god i can't wait to see oh, them yeah. i do have a question on I, that so if you've got the baron who is purely making decisions for self preservation and to like further his own personal gain yeah. and the fremens which are a united force um where individual lives don't necessarily matter but the furtherment of everyone is what's prioritized where does paul sit he i mean he's literally in the middle and trying there's a he wants that it's not right down this quote but why does he want that throne so bad i think he wants revenge still he definitely That's wants revenge yep. but i also think he's very concerned about not um not fulfilling one of the futures that he saw with the house atreides banner and every right. time something happens he's like how do i stop this he's worried about jessica he's worried about these Ooh, different mom's all of a sudden the enemy mm, 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 mm. I, oh yeah i know and then also he's got the had the vision where he got stabbed mm -hmm. you don't know what it was with yeah. but we've seen so many chris knives out there there's <laughs> a lot of chris knives and it was the fremen in the caves with the chris knife <laughs> And then they were getting high on the on the drug, whatever it was. And then Cheney was like, I had a vision. It's our baby. We're holding our baby. And that was crazy trippy too. That was, isn't she like 15? <laughs> yeah, you know, I mean, but it's, it's also, you know. He's 16. 15? Yeah. He's 15. He's, he's 15. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I didn't know that uh, Faye Rather was only 17. Yeah. It's that sort of, you know, um, middle ages, yeah, when you said yeah. royalty, I mean, they were all super, super young and married mm -hmm. off super young, and that's and also I, all I, of the getting the good luck. Like, 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 not good, life feel like I was crazy. I'm not gonna do the math on that one yeah. of where I would be now. It's <laughs> also we, weird. I, I, old hags, what are we? Yeah, if you're like 23 and not married, sure, sure, sure. Uh, old, old maids, I don't know. I want to be a Benny, not Benny Jester, <laughs> but like. I'm just a witch. Whichever yeah. culture it is, I promise I won't cool. try to make um, weird bloodlines. Let's talk as if I'm not already a witch. Ooh. I'm trying. Well, I'm the vampire. If we go back to interview with the vampires, I'm the vampire. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'll make be sense. werewolf. I am. Wait. Well, then what am I? Wait, Maude, you're the werewolf. What well, am you I supposed to be? Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. All right. What was I gonna say? I know. I would. Oh, I know I'm what I was gonna say. say. Your Faye? Okay, yeah, that makes sense. Oh, um, yeah, 100%. There is a, a, it was funny because I had to keep checking myself with Fade being 17 years old because I was picturing Sting from the yeah, David Lynch like, film. Like 24? Yeah, and then, you know, Sting is now, you know, Sting is eternal, but I kept picturing Sting, so I had to be like, he said, but he's 17, Sting, but he's 17, Sting, Sting's he's 17. a warlock. Warlock, Five yeah. Minutes. Some Five great, com things. great comments in the chat. Uh, Stilgar in the David Lynch film was Everett McGill, AKA Big Ed from Twin Peaks, which is cool. Clever Girl said, I think sometimes harsh experience causes people to shut down emotionally. It's a way of conserving energy. That's true. And they're kind of, that's, that's what they talk it's about in the book. Jay, Jay Buntrock, uh, Jay Buntrock is, is going off of that and saying, not only do they bottle their water, they bottle up their emotions. Very true. And then Game Wizard says Frank Herbert would also say he warned us about the danger of charismatic leaders and how they need a warning label. Maybe hazardous to your health. Absolutely. But Absolutely. also charismatic is very generous. Yeah. Um, <laughs> generous. All I'm going to say about that. Yeah. Leaders yep. are charismatic. I don't think that you, if you don't have any charisma, I don't think that you have leadership qualities. Like. I mean, I would agree with that, but. Yeah. I can think of one it's exception. I can think of an exception people. that mm -hmm. charismatic to some people. That's true. Was mm. at some point and is yeah. now. Anyway, <laughs> we're all on the same page here. Uh, so 
Um, I also really love the term weirding, sort of the Benny Jesserit term for their physical fighting. I'm definitely going to use that in my everyday conversation. I, um, I really love her exploring, like when she's in a conversation, how her mind, I almost see it be like clicks and divides, where yeah. one part of her mind is listening to the tone of her opponent's voice and then once she can see and understand the rhythmic and tonal nature of the voice she can then control that person and then another part is going into all of her studies learning everything from the Bene Gesserit going into archives almost and like you know uh sort of the sort of you know yes Alice type yeah um and then also kind of like reading into the words and what that means and what the best sort of like rebuttal would be to be able to you know control that situation just the way the Ben and Jesperate work it's exciting to me I love it absolutely yeah. I I don't you know agree with their goals handed down but the the to be in this kind of a society where you're with the Fremen and you are a servant or a woman you are a witch or a wife and even in you know the high society I'm not a witch you are- I'm your wife I don't know if I want to be that anymore. Bye-bye, boys. Um, Wait, what are you two quoting? Princess Bride. Bride. Okay, on, that's what I thought. Bird. That's what I thought. <laughs> Sorry, uh, I can't read read on the show. Um, but the... I lost my train of thought. Sorry. <laughs> oh, it was so bad of me. No, 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 no. It's okay. I will her. never be upset about a Princess Bride quote reference ever. Um, but you're even in the royal society jessica has these internal sort of um am i sort of buying into the patriarchy sort of um internalized misogyny of well paul better watch out for these desert women better to be a concubine than a wife all Mm -hmm. of that kind of stuff where she was a concubine who was respected and i mean technically that's what she was right she was a secretary Mm -hmm. which is a lot um but there's there aren't a lot of options for women anyway. You could be the um, the countess um, who's basically there to merge the bloodlines with Fade Still Rome. Still a Bene Exactly, at, but they are at least, they, in this world, the system, the way that it works, I would 100% be on board with the methods that they're using, and it's, still relevant today sometimes you have to say what you mean in a nicer way because you don't want to be the bitch and then it just becomes a whole thing and i i appreciate that that she and the benny jesserit draw from their training and their knowledge their um sort of uh and and not just empathy like she's clearly an empath where the reading the tone of voice and feeling what people are feeling like that's an actual thing mm-hmm. that you can know how to talk to someone based on their face, their tone, how they're reacting. And it feels right. mystical because it's like, I don't, how do I know this? But it, it is picking up on cues, but there are all these different, there's magic, there's knowledge and there's empathy. And for me, that's just super exciting that that's how they're subverting the system. It's not perfect. It definitely has some very touchy goals um, that they're trained into, but that actual methodology, if you don't have any power, you do have to figure out weird yeah. manipulative ways to be heard. Yeah. It so made me Doodle think Dandy of- Dandy actually just commented, so sorry on the, um, I'm, I'm looking at the YouTube stream chat at the moment, who said that Kynes is just mostly dead. <laughs> <laughs> good quote, good quote. Yeah, I would love to see whoever made The Princess Bride take on the world of Dune. That'd be a great parody. That would be a really funny movie. <laughs> but, uh, like Aaron is like, I Robin shall Hood. do this. <laughs> you can parody Dude. Robin Hood, like successfully. Yeah. Oh yeah. You can, you can you can parody anything. You can parody you anything with nipples, parody really. Parody something. Mm-hmm. Can, you um, parody, can you parody me? Yeah. Yeah, you can. Uh, technically, yeah. Robert De Niro from Me yep. to Parents. Uh, <laughs> the, the, Jessica, very nice. That's a, that's a good face, Mod. That's pretty good. Um, <laughs> Jessica reminded me of, no, stop. You, no, you, no, it's bad. It's bad. <laughs> we talked about this. Do you want to do, you want to go through the steps? You want to do the steps right now? <laughs> want to go through the steps? Okay. The first one is 
the first one is eyebrows. Okay. I you're do gonna that be, now. You're gonna, <laughs> you're gonna be you're gonna be really like questioning like and kind of mad. I already then, can't do it with my eyebrows. And then you squint your eyes. Okay, you squint, you bring your cheeks up and you kind of squint. And then then you make a frowny face as though <laughs> it's like you're tasting fish or something. You take like, and you weren't expecting it. And then you just <laughs> shake your head. And then you Why shake your head. Like, <laughs> well, it hurts to be Robert De Niro. With that much talent, it hurts. That's that's what you're from his pain. I think I've got a bit of Mick yeah. Jagger. Yeah, you're doing Mick Jagger. <laughs> I taught you how to do Robert De Niro and you're doing Mick Jagger. That's right. Very I impressive. I can't even. Okay. Hey, Rachel. Hey, trick. Rachel, yeah. That, anyway, that's how you do a Robert De Niro. Um, what I was going to say was the, the, the thing where Jessica was using her abilities made me think of, and the way you were describing it, Maude, made me think of like Russell Crowe in A Beautiful Mind, or even like, um, oh man, I just dream catcher? A, a little bit of dream catcher, a little bit of like, you know, Monica, slowing, slowing thing down, slow motion. What's that? What? Mm -hmm. Mambo mm -hmm. number five. Mm -hmm. Mambo number five. Oh, yeah. a little bit of Jessica in your life. Yeah. Uh, a little bit of Ch Chaney by my side. <laughs> That's all she's ever going to be good for. Thanks. A little bit of Paul. Um, <laughs> and, and it made me think like, what, are the, what is it going to look like in this upcoming live action film? The, 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 and especially at the end of the section where she's getting high on this drug apparently and everybody's kind of tripping out on this drug and they literally talk about like time stopping and she can feel molecules and yeah. like, it was so incredible and such a great description. I, I can show you what that looks like. Uh oh. <laughs> Would I need would it would I need to use it for medicinal so, purposes? Real talk, was Frank June using hallucinogenics? I mean, I, like a, here's oh, the thing. Okay. It's nine, It's what nineteen sixty sixties. Yeah. If, if you eyes. Oh, I'm actually gonna see like multifaceted like, yeah, yes, oceans absolutely. of time. Yeah. If, there is a valid. I mean, people use not me. It's bad for me. Hypothetically, um, hallucinogenics hallucinogenics for therapy purposes microdosing, but also opening up you know your mind in certain ways sometimes you're just silly or you freak out but a lot of people take and learn a lot about themselves yep. from taking hallucinogenics even in big small doses but it's super 60s yeah. um and if you if you told me part of the story is just like this yeah. can open your mind but it's not just sensual even though at the end of this section that definitely goes that place but it's it's intellectual it opens yeah. up paul's mind and the difference between all of them um or everyone who has so far tried the spice especially if they are trained in certain ways it really does just open everything up in sort of a really overwhelming way it's almost Again. a little bit like the matrix in the way where the spice yeah. is you know, I, I think that red pill and blue pill has been completely taken mm -hmm. from that particular meaning of yep. matrix. I'm sticking with the original Which, uh, idea, to avoid any confusion. Lana yep. Wachowski has like, some choice words for yep. anyone using red pill, blue pill in a political mm. sense. Yes, you yeah, did. You're wrong. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I'm, I'm thinking about it in the matrix turn where it's like, would you like to stay ignorant and in your little bubble of safety? Or would you like to know yeah. like, what else is out there? Like something bigger than you. Uh, it, and it, that's what Paul has done in that way. Yeah. Like Spice is really like being his, the, the pill to his outside of the matrix where he can see these. And I mm -hmm. love how Frank, I love his wording and descriptions and, you know, wordage of his experiencing his, what does he call them? Prescient thoughts. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, the, mm -hmm. the prescient sort of like um, when he's inundated with it and sometimes it can change. Sometimes he feels like he's against a brick wall. Like, uh, I love how the mind sort of like unfolds. And then that section, and then that section at the end where they describe like Jessica was feeling when she was experiencing this drug and it was being changed because of her Bene Gesserit, you know, biology, that it was as, as if somebody who had hands their whole life all of a sudden lost them and was explaining to everybody like, hey, I don't have hands, but nobody else had hands. So they're like, what are you talking about? What are hands? Like that yeah. description I thought was really, really interesting. So if you told me that Frank Herbert was definitely on some psychotropic whatever <laughs> stuff in the 60s, yeah. I would believe it. But if you also told me that no, he never it's was. He studied it and it was around him culturally. Yeah. Absolutely. I don't or he's just, I, I remember 
I also remember in the in, in the introduction about uh, by Brian Herbert talking about how his father, when he sort of like got into science fiction and was reading science fiction, and I feel like I have never taken any hallucinogenic drugs either, but I have read like superhero yeah. comics my whole life, and in and whether or not those writers have have taken stuff in the '60s and and whatever era, it still comes through in the fiction, and so maybe Frank could have also just been inspired by whatever he was. Tapping into oh, absolutely. science fiction, absolutely. But I'm saying I could go either way. If you told me yes, he did, I'd be like, oh, it's in the writing. But if you told me no, he didn't, I'd be like, oh, well, he's a great writer, and that makes sense too. He could also talk to you know, doing research for a project like this and having these ideas because it was in the cultural zeitgeist so heavily in the '60s. Yeah, you. I mean, I've I've never, for example, done DMT. It sounds very scary to me, um, but I I know what people have experienced on it because I've talked to many people who have which only solidified me not wanting to do it <laughs> um, but they they enjoyed it but you don't I mean you don't need necessarily with the caveat of certain general perspectives in terms of writing for other people who have had very different cultural experiences than you um, but generally, you can write about things, they say write what you know, but you can still write detective stuff and have themes, you know. Mm -hmm. Hi, baby. Hi. Mm -hmm. um, I kind of want to move the conversation on a little bit. We're talking about Paul's catalysts. Yeah. So the catalyst of Spice opening up his inner eye, in a way. Um, but I also want to talk about the fact that he made his first kill. Yes. This is a really, really big deal. Um, how he fought, um, how, how he gained help. Uh, and how that was perceived by, I almost want to call them the tribe because in a way that they are, mm -hmm. um, but also Jessica's reaction, uh, which was scolding him for it. Which um, I think was good for him. I think I, I'm nervous. I understand that the Benny Jesser can be, could be a catalyst for some horrible shit um, as a whole. But I do think that she is looking out to keep him from going down to, and I don't agree with anything she says about desert women, just to be super clear, but um, <laughs> he's, he's sort of riding this high. He doesn't want to kill um, Jameis. Ja Jameis. Yeah. And By the way, Jameis has anger management problem. Like, he's, oh God. He, as soon as we met him, I was like, he's like, going to be trouble. Yeah. He challenged Stilgar every chance that he got. Like, mm -hmm. nah, dude. So and then we learned, him. and then we learned that Jameis killed like his his wife or his girlfriend's like yeah. previous like, husband yeah jeff with a claim g her because she's but a it's, it's jeff. jeff yeah it's still jeff james killed jeff i'm like james needed some therapy dude oh 100 percent needed therapy overly he was reactive he sees this toxic 15... masculinity all toxic he's, he's, masculinity. he's a 15 year old kid and he goes for the betterment of the tribe i'm gonna test him on the prophecy and kill this 15 year old knowing kid? that it would result in death and so he's yeah, eager. And Paul like, doesn't even know that, and neither right. does Jessica. But I do well, like actually he wanted to attack Jessica first because Jessica bested him. Yes. Like, and Jessica and was like, okay. By that. Sure. But then yeah, Jessica's camp I'll fight you. Because Jessica felt that if you know she was trying to have this like deity kind of illusion put into place, and mm -hmm. by her killing a man, that could probably disrupt that a little bit. So it needed mm -hmm. to be She's blah, blah, so blah. smart and strategic in everything she does, and I think that Paul really needs that. Yeah, she 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 makes him feel the weight of what's happening because he is being sort of lifted up as this hero for beating um, Jameis in combat, and they're sort of celebrating. And here, take all my water, and she's like, "This is your first kill. You need to take this seriously because as much as he's seeing this future of." you know, the House of Trades banner and bloodshed and trying to stop this jihad, he's still not experienced that. And it is, I think, easy in a world like this to become desensitized yeah. to murdering people. And if you're going to be a leader, it should affect you. You should mourn any kind of loss, even if it's part of this system. Well, then it cut to the fact that we go back to the Baron after all of this, after we've spent a chunk of the book learning about the diamonds, yeah. we right. go into a gladiator battle. And oh. I thought it was quite interesting that they wanted to use something that was very much ingrained in the history of Earth 
and use mm -hmm. it to represent the Harkonnens. But then again, when we see what uh, they've used with the Harkonnens to just emphasize the villainy behind it, the fact that there is a gladiator battle with a slave really does make sense. His yeah. 100th slave that he's killed, I'm pretty yeah. sure. The, I, yeah. That's the thing. So death becomes a sport. And so mm -hmm. Jessica is trying to humanize. Exactly. Life because it's not. It's, yeah. And the fact and that I, the Fremens aren't really like super intuitive with mortality. Like mortality is such a way of life that if it yeah. happens, it's supposed to happen. Whereas I think she's trying to find the difference between you know, not feeling anything when you die or needing to die and finding uh, entertainment in death. Because uh, she looked around yeah. and wasn't the crowd like a little bit exhilarated yeah. with what was mm -hmm. going on? And she's like, no, no, no. Yeah, and that's the thing. He started kind of like, he made his kill. Uh, yeah, and I think to shut that down and mm -hmm. to also exert her power, again, being the theme of the book, over him uh, and like belittle him publicly was a really good move but of, like he's already being told he's the chosen one by pretty much everyone he goes Honestly, from this revenge. Is like having a 15 year old be getting famous online where it's like if we don't keep you a <laughs> child and raise you right without you thinking that you're super big and that your fame makes you visible we have problems. We have a Logan Paul on our hands <laughs> if we don't do something, people. No, red alert. Uh, my older brother, who's uh, 18 years older than me and like 6'5", he makes me feel like a tiny baby and I'm also very tall. Um, a, he used to call me woman when I was little and oh, I would right. yell at him, but he would, it was giving me shit, but he was, he teased me a lot in a way that um, I was surprised, a very sensitive child. Um, but he would be like, I'm, I need to give you tough love because I will, I'll murder someone for you if I have to. Um, but it, the world is not necessarily kind and you are smart and still like, you know, all those things, but I'm glad he did because when, you know, internet people or other situ, anytime someone gives me shit, it's like, okay, like. That's not yeah. my problem. And I think that he needs that humility to be a good leader. And he needs to find the balance between the Fremen and, you know, the sort of royal society. And even when he's having these visions, it's him walking this very fine line between the two. And it's almost like looking at his Mentat training and the Bene Gesserit, how you can pull from both of those elements. I think caring about the people and um, and doing what is right for society and those that follow you and not letting them get lost or become these sort of religious fanatics. That is one of his biggest fears is like jihad carried out in his name. So mm -hmm. neither one is a hundred percent correct. Obviously one is a lot better than the other, but they're both systems that he can pull from like you do with your parents. Take the good that you learn from them and maybe Mm -hmm. keep some of the bad habits i i liked how to go back to what uh mod mentioned which is the section with the baron the the harkonnens or the harkonnens going back to that section that section for me was a little bit what i like to call crunchy it was a little bit difficult for me to get through i didn't like it, kind of, it yeah it felt I was very actually relieved because it usually like the balance in the first book was to go between the atreides then to the harkonnens True. and it was like kind of a nice balance and i actually started feeling and wearing a lot of the all right we've been in the caves with the Fremen for a little while oh. now so then to move back to the Harkonnens was relieving but for this story I do not think that this will make it into the movie I'm very curious about that too because well first of all that's a great observation because I want to talk about where we think we talked about this last week yeah. where we think this first movie is going to end and I kind of have one of two ideas for where it's yeah. going to end and that section may or may not make the cut but the, the, the Baron, the Harkonnen section, along with like the Count and the Countess or whoever the new two characters were that were sort of introduced, or maybe yeah, they're- Yeah, Countess. Yeah, or maybe they were introduced before, but I just wasn't registering it. And Fade killing his 100th whatever, like it was a little bit crunchy for me, meaning it was very well written, but it was that otherworldly language that sometimes made it difficult for me to relate to exactly what's going on. But the way that Maude described it and how we're talking about it made me realize it's a great- setup it's a great setup in comparison to what paul is going through and yeah. because i've only i haven't read this book none of us have we're reading it for the first time 
I've only seen the David Lynch film. I have some ideas of where things may go in the next two weeks, but I'm still very open to being pleasantly surprised and things yeah. may change because movies are different than books. I don't remember the plot of the movie, I just remember. But I think it's a great setup for like, here's this fade character, young man, 17. Look at how different he is. Look at how different he's being raised. He's the foil. Yeah. Then, then Paul, it's really Joker to his Batman. I feel like is what the, they're the doing. Count, the Count made a comment about that when yep. he was talking yeah. to the Countess about- If only the Atreides boy had lived. He oh. had better upbringing. Too bad we lost- oh, the Too late, bad. Late but, out, like. Yeah, they were saying that Fade had such potential, but he's been raised by this, you know, power hungry dictator. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And he's been, yeah, poisoned, but his bloodline's still good. So let's try and like get in his head, control him so we can use the bloodline. Mm -hmm. And again, I'm like, mm -hmm. take what you got to take from that. I, uh, yeah, great I comment think that, in the chat. Go ahead. Julie Manning says, Jessica called Paul a killer to keep it real with him. Wanted Paul to understand that he took a life, even if he didn't want to. Uh, Colin says, motherhood is a central theme in Dune. You have Reverend Mothers, Bene Gesserit. Cheney giving birth to a nation, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Rachel, what was your point? Oh, or Maud, I, Maud, Maud has a point, Maud. Yeah, Do you think Paul mother. would have cried and shed water if Jessica hadn't drilled him on the notion of death? I, I don't know. I don't know. That's a great because question. That was the point that changed Paul's perspective. Yes, um, and, everyone. And he, remember, he didn't cry. He didn't mourn at first. He didn't cry at first when his father died, when he realized his father was dead. Yep. It took him a beat and then he let himself do it. I think that's a great observation, Maude. Like maybe he wouldn't have, maybe he wouldn't have. And Jessica uh, unknowingly helped him because as soon as he did shed tears, everyone was like, oh, he sheds tears for the one he killed. Consequence mm -hmm. to action. Empathy, Empathy yeah. is important. Uh, I, I totally think that Jessica points that out to him and that is a crucial part of his sort of development he doesn't even want to participate in these funeral rites at first necessarily he's like i just killed this guy like this how can i call him a friend i actually him. i really like i was in his shoes in that moment and i thought the writing and the unfolding of that was really well done because people are coming forth in this tradition that they've never been a part of and it hasn't been explained to them so he's in the dark completely trying to wing it and there's yeah, everyone looking at him up. going go but he's like i took his life who am i to step forward and claim him as a friend and i that, thought that that part was really like i really did mm -hmm. like that oh moment. me absolutely i agree but i think that you look at jessica and someone like you said someone can say one thing and her brain goes oh i understand this and i think she understands right away mm -hmm. what this means and last week we were talking about you know religious approaches to death and how different cult i know i took a class <laughs> in college but they how different religions treat their dead and i was i maybe did like in a mental fist pump at this quote because it basically is why I took that class, which uh, I will read very briefly, it's two sentences, but um, during the funeral, Jessica nodded, recognizing the ancient source of the funeral rite, and she thought, the meeting between ignorance and knowledge, between brutality and culture, it begins in the dignity with which we treat our dead. And I think that that's sort of the positive element of religious beliefs, not just, Hector, what you were saying about the environmentalism, but just religious beliefs inherently are a code they are a way to live and they should treat you teach you to treat people with respect to teach you to respect the dead to respect the environment around you we ask the same questions how did we get mm -hmm. here what happens when we die all of those things but it it can be taken by another system of power and used to manipulate a huge you know, group of people. And the Fremen for, you know, all of the issues we may have with their culture, that is a very pure goal. That is a, um, right. that is how I think you can sort of view religion as a positive force. It reminded me of like, this has happened to me a couple of times, especially when I was a kid, I would go to a friend's house and then sit down for dinner. And then they would all of a sudden be like, Say okay, Grace. Grace. And I'd be like, oh, me too, me too, Dang. me too. I'd be like, oh shit. Oh, uh, what do I and they'd look to you and you'd be like. Yeah. I, uh, no. You go, you go. Yeah. You go, I'm here. I'm observing, totally mm -hmm. respectful. I love God. Yeah. 
God's yeah. great. Yeah. God. Amen. Let's eat what this food. What's Amen. Right? Yeah, that's it. That's such a great relatable. <laughs> I know, or you're just like someone yeah. else's religion or culture, and you want to be respectful, and especially you know what as they kid, say. you're like, it's cool. Yeah. I don't have an issue with anything, but I'm a little uncomfortable because I'm I don't a kid. Want but you know what they say: when in Rome. <laughs> um, I really want to talk about Jessica, but also Jessica at the end when she goes through this process with um, basically becoming a reverend mother. Uh, I really want to acknowledge that she was stuck between a wall and a hard place and she had yep. to choose the lesser of two evils. Okay. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, but what, yeah, really... what, 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 what were her options? Because this whole section was very beautifully written. Reverend mother, That's religious right. uh, leader, religious kind of like deity esque of like the overseer of the place who wouldn't ever marry, who Which, wouldn't have their own life, who would be sign like, me up. Sign the me up. priest or nun or someone's wife and not just the wife, but a wife. Mm. So, and then and this was like, this was um, There's no Stilgar. concept of a widow. Have we noticed that in the Fremens? There's no concept yeah. of a widow. Oh, you're, you're a, a woman or a servant and you're attached to this dude who killed whomever, who killed- And if your man decides one. to go and put his life at risk, then you are literally transferred as if you are a possession. The, qu the you know, question so is- She was like, I'm still young. I still- yeah. Oh my God. Like, Maybe oh, no. I'm so emotional no, girl, and no. well. hitting me really hard is because she was pleading that she was still young and that she had worth because her youth was desirable yeah, feel, and that she had wife, two yeah. kids and technically two husbands already, and she was holding on to that. You cut out, but I bet you it was really, really good. That is like being a host in your 30s in LA. <laughs> I'm still young. <laughs> You'll yeah. still be me. It's, and then, it's valuing the wrong things, and it's I do like that Paul is like, I will take care of you. It's all good. You don't need to. Because he, well, he didn't even ask sure. for that, you know. No. There is a choice in that, and the yeah. fact that he, you know they like, you can have her for a year and then just let her go. And he's like, no, no, I will take care of you. Mm -hmm. And I do like I but did like that. Stilgar said you have to take care of her no matter what for a year. Yeah, is for what a year. Because he he did also run through the options of like if she's a servant and you don't take her on as a wife, then she will become free and she can yeah. do whatever she wants. But then Stilgar but goes she was panicking about that. That wasn't the goal. The notion of her being yeah, she wanted to be the wife sense. for this sort of so, security, which is the, the question is the question is is fact. is science fiction author Frank Herbert in the sixties is he using these story points as something that he wants to comment on, or is he just one of the people in the in of his era that it, that might be using outdated what we consider now outdated like depictions of women and depictions of, of, of relationships between men and women in society and stuff. That's the question. That's I the question. I don't know what the answer is. I think it's, but I mean, I think you have to look at this contextually and realize that this is only the beginning, you know, mid sixties of the civil rights movement and the feminist movement, all of these things that, you know, we can take for granted that are very, very recent. Mm -hmm. um, and obviously still have a bajillion miles to go in terms of how we treat other people mm -hmm. um but i do think that having jessica choose to be basically i i like the example of a nun but i also think it's more badass than that it's this crone right you turn into this yeah wise weirding you know she has so much power as a benny jesserit and as a concubine to start she has all this Madame Tyrell. What's her name? Oh yeah, mm. Elena Tyrell. Ex yes. Game of oh, Thrones. God. Perfect. Oh, just watch scenes with her. That's all you. Uh, honestly, she mm, love her. Mm. Uh, Charlotte Rampling is either the. I think she's the sort of um, the Reverend Mother at the beginning. I believe that makes Paul his hand in the box and all that. Charlotte Rampling, yeah, yeah. I know they're different. No, I know they're different, but I think Charlotte Rampling plays the one in the beginning. Oh, the, sorry, my I'm bad. I'm not 100% sure, but love her, Zardos. We'll talk about that later, but <laughs> we won't. No, we I'll won't. Just, I'll, I'll text, yeah, I'll, and I will also just text you guys we, about Zardos. We but, never have to talk about Zardos. 
Is that based off a book? Are we ever going to read Zardoz? Let's read Zardoz. No, no, but it has a lot of Wizard of Oz tie-ins. I really want to do my own, just like people watch this with me. I'm going to just drink <laughs> wine and watch it. Anyway, uh -huh. but I, I know I'm sad, but <laughs> we have 15 minutes. I just really want to talk about the idea that Jessica is pregnant. She decides to become, you know, uh, you know, the mega witch of this, of the Fremen. And the fact that the Bene Gesserit sort of lore and legend is so prevalent in this society that they basically have, they've called their version of Reverend Mothers, Reverend Mothers, even though they're not technically part of the Bene Gesserit necessarily because of all of this sort of prophecy planting. But then she, she drinks this poison, she's able to change it into something that you know a super cool drug tea essentially yeah, but she gets her in her hallucinogenic phase can see dna or whatever it is yes and really reconstruct it so it doesn't and harm the history her. of the Benny gesserit and of humanity and it reminded me a bit of lock and key when mm. they start throwing they lock and key love the comics love the myself in the face of this ribbon um <laughs> love the show on netflix give me season two um but they basically open up the sort of mind key into their own mind and start chucking books in to learn new things this character to impress a girl which i would have appreciated in high school honestly um but this idea that it just opens up her mind in a very different way paul is looking totally to the future and seeing all of these possibilities and she is learning from the past and learning from, and I think both are important, but at, they're sort of diametrically opposed and they have been as characters. And I think that's only going to get worse. Ooh, Steven, wisdom versus knowledge, a hundred percent. And, but I love that when she's going through this sort of weird drug trip, the Reverend mother prone is basically like, you didn't tell us you were pregnant. It's a good thing you're having a girl the boy wouldn't have survived. And I was like, okay. What? Yes. Did you miss that? I caught that, but I'm also like, I know what I know from having seen the film and I don't want to get into it because we haven't mm. gotten to the next section yet. Yeah. But I'm like, how did that happen? What is it? Is it just a sort of like magical mysticism of the world of Dune where, and I don't know if I want to say what I think happened happened because it might not, be what I think it is, mm -hmm. you know, pulling my knowledge from from the film and stuff like that. But I think it's like a fascinating, fascinating yeah. subplot of this of this story. And I would I would love because we're we're coming up on the end. Uh, I'd love to talk a little bit more about this on the after show and online. But the idea that Paul gets his powers because he is trained. He ends up in all of these places. Meanwhile, Jessica goes through this experience and her unborn daughter is being bombarded with powers and is going to sort of be, be powerful at birth, which like brings up original sin, like sort of kids being the product of original sin or their parents' experiences and trauma, but also the fact that Paul is given sort of every opportunity up until he gets to Arrakis to learn and train and have all of this where she's just going to be born with some batshit powers and have to figure it out and I'm just it made me very excited to hopefully read future books um, on my mm -hmm. own to just see like who this character is going to be because if Paul is the you know the the mediocre white boy who's given a lot of powers. This is sort of a chosen one. Yeah. Buffy, I, I, Buffy I think, type where it's thrust upon you without any training, without any yeah. training at all. I think, I've never read this book and I'm going off of me having seen only the David Lynch film. I feel like there's going to be a time skip from the from what we just read to the beginning of book three because like I, I, like, I can't see it still sort of progressing in real time because I know where things may be going. And I also feel like this whole section was a response to Duke Leto being assassinated and then Jessica and Paul having to escape into the desert and then them dealing with this. I feel like this yeah, third book is gonna go like, time skip. How much time has is gonna be have, have passed is what the question is. Yeah. Hakuna, or 
Yeah. Yes. Matata. He's gonna Hakuna Matata. He's Simba, and it's gonna Hakuna mm -hmm. Matata, and the Fremen and are. Boss is main and get Ramon and Pumba. Bigger. Exactly. Still Gar is. Man, Pumbaa. that was almost a sexual awakening for me. I'll tell you what. When he grows a mane, and I was just oh, like, the middle one, like the Lion King Simba oh. between grown-up Simba and baby Simba, the middle All one, right. we've like got a mohawk. Yeah. yeah. Uh -huh. I can't fault you because the other the other side of that is that when Nala made those eyes at Simba, we all know. We all know what those eyes meant. And How can you have bedroom eyes if you've never seen a bedroom? <laughs> I don't know, but kids, we all knew instinctively. We're like, that's bedroom eyes. This yep. is going to get this is going to get crazy. Yeah. And then, um, yeah. uh, lots of great uh, comments. Uh, Steven says, like, all the men who have tried to become Kwisaz Haderach. Thank you. Kwisaz Haderach have died according to the Reverend Mother Moahim at the beginning, which is really interesting because who knows what's gonna happen with Paul, but mm. I'm and just, then, I, yeah. And then Lee Travis says alias prophecy. Watch and then Steven alias. says alias is so cool later on. And then it's just, they're just talking about alias. No, this Alia time. is <laughs> so Oh, cool. <laughs> I thought alias they were talking about- Really good for the first two, three seasons. And then <laughs> not great the second two, but okay. worth a watch for the ending. So they were following the OC Bible. You know, I don't actually like it when they get stuck too much into the prophecy. I feel like that's what detracts from it. Anyway. Alias? Yeah. From Doom? But everyone talking about Alia in the comments, they're saying no spoilers, but that the books get a lot better because she's amazing. Oh, cool. Yeah. I know. It made, this section made me be like the fact that, you know, well, <laughs> Jesus. You got to read this stupid comment from know, Stephen. So I want to embarrass him. Stephen it's posted so in the chat. There's the quiz arts had a rack, but uh, Star Pilot 6 says the quiz knows had track. Yeah. I love nice. it so much. I love it so much. Thank you, Star Pilot We had Plato Lado, and that helped. So uh, honestly, it, it every helped. time I say Lado, I think Plato before I say it. So wait, Lee, Tra Lee Travis, Travis says, say it like Arnold Schwarzenegger. Oh, <laughs> the quiz knows oh, hat rack. <laughs> What a great meme. Do you mean Throw the Chris Nose hat track? Uh... It's a good okay. bit. Um, good and bit. then the the end, we're gonna we're wrapping up. We're gonna get into where you can continue this conversation, but just Paul becomes a man in the uh, traditional backward sense uh, with Cheney. Do they uh, hook up? Think... Wait, they wait, wait, wait. They hook up? Yes. At the end of just... the section, she like leads him by the hand, and they're oh, you can't you can't read the sexual oh tension gosh. between Shane oh, and his hole. It, but it was it was it's there. I know but... there's no water, but they are thirsty. Yeah, I'm sorry. Like, have you have have you guys never been at a party and been led into a bedroom, and then you just end up talking? Is that only me? Is that why I read into that that I'm like you guys are just talking? No, Thank I you, Stephen. Thank you. That's how you build chemistry. That's how you build. Yeah, I know an emotional connection, which is imperative. But that's all, where they're developing. All that happened in the section. They had a great, this very yeah, emotional. Like they allude to what happens okay. next, which I appreciated because they're 15. But I did like how there was sort of this romantic element and also they're in this circumstance where she's sort of the first young person. She's is, always kind of looking is out there for it. Is their relationship fate? If he didn't have the vision, would it be together? Would they be together? Or because he mm -hmm. saw the vision of her saying, Uso, tell me about the waters of your world. But and listen. As soon as he saw her, he was like, you're the girl from the vision, therefore connect. But listen, real talk. If you meet the love of your life, say it's what Oscar Isaac. The prophecy or the actual event. Right. I would like to say that it's Oscar Isaac, please. Let's say, let's say that you meet the love of your life. Let's say in a hypothetical, it's Oscar Isaac. And the first thing he says to you is, you're the person from my vision. We're meant to be together. And at first you're like, no, man, come on. And then that means that he's going to pursue you. You'll date. You'll fall in love. You will get married, whatever, whatever. And then when you guys are 99 years old on your deathbed, he turns to you and he goes, I lied. It wasn't a prophecy. I just did it. To, does that not mean all of that is it's a moot? lie? No. Well, that that they only happened in Blood, Blood, which is a show that I have rewatched this quarantine. Oh, I want to rewatch that. So okay. what happens is he puts okay. her under this kind of <laughs> control, and she finds out yeah. later that the yeah. only reason why she was attracted to him was because he had her blood. Blah 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 blah. So it was based on a lie, and it didn't work out. Yeah, that's there. There is that element. I will also just pop culture reference. I just caught up on Rick and Morty, and not this recent one, but the the 
two weeks ago that has these uh, basically the video game like go back to your save point and which is a show you can watch on Geek and Sundry um, but go with Becca Scott but you he can there's no consequences theoretically I don't know if anyone watched it but there is a whole romance that happens that reminded me of this conversation but we're going to keep it going right. in the after show but for right now we have homework and we covered a lot but we have a lot more to cover so one more book try- yeah we said three in the book but even just for this section if you have thoughts we would love for you to join us after this um but many other places goodreads twitter etc we would love to hear from you so your homework for next week is to read the first half of part three book three in dune that is the book within a book someone else can find the section if they have it uh part three the prophet um stop at the end of the chapter that says who can survive the test that the reverend mothers have survived Ooh. That is very intriguing. If you get to the chapter that starts with Chaney came up, you've read too far. Um, I will also, and Maude, will look for, yes, the audiobook um, stopping point. And if other people find it in their copy, there's so many amazing copies of this in print, including this lovely one that looks like Penguin sent us. Um, In the Penguin Deluxe hardcover, that that is page 539. And... In the recent paperback, it is page 709. So bigger pages, smaller pages. Thank you so much to Penguin for these gorgeous books. It is, it's also just really nice as an audiobook listener now convert to- Page 539. Yep. And then there's the audiobook, but I love having this as a reference point for pulling out quotes and reading over sections again after I've listened to it. Um, Thank you to the Hideaway Wine Company for sending us delicious wines that I have had quite a bit of uh, tonight uh, for our viewers of Legal Drinking Age, which in the United States is 21. (gasps) It's a kitty. Hi. She's like, no. (laughs) Which one is that? Cakey or? That's cakey. She hates it. She hates people. She hates me. She's the best. No. Cat life. That's just cat (laughs) cat life. the Hideaway Wine Company, who has sent us these amazing wines, you are 21 and over in the U.S. of legal drinking age everywhere else, which is probably younger and you probably are more responsible. Anyway, uh, please find out more about them at the hideawaylo.com. Uh, you can order wine, order the, join their wine club, drink a lot of this wine. Do what you're going to do. Um, you can check out previous episodes of Nerdist Book Club on Nerdist and Geek and Sundry's YouTube or Geek and Sundry's Twitch. Please like and subscribe. Maude, where are we going now? So every single book club, even though we spend an hour and a half talking about the book, we kind of air our thoughts on it all and have a discussion between the three of us. What we do for the official after show is that we move over to Geek Bomb's Discord. To get access to that, though, you do have to join up to the Patreon. It's the lowest tier, which is just five bucks. But every single week, you'll get another half an hour where we'll actually talk about your questions. Yeah, it's been an hour and a half as well. (laughs) Uh, We'll talk about your questions, your concerns. You get to bring up a point of discussion with us. And that happens over a voice chat Uh, soon. Maybe could move into video chat, but for now, voice chat. Um, And so we'd love to see you there as well because it's super personal. I guess, wait, personable? Intimate, yeah. Yeah, it's really, really intimate. It's a lot of fun. Um, The diehards that you have seen in the chat who are basically making the best comments that we get to read out, they're all going to be there as well. It's a tight-knit community full of amazing people, and we'd love to have you on board. Awesome, yeah. And people will get into, like, teach us about the religious, like, all of these different, you know, mythologies and and religious texts and themes that we haven't even considered so uh well, there's some there's some dune heads in that chat there there's are some, some dune, dune heads. heads it's super fun Fair um, to get you. but otherwise find us on twitter facebook you know us insta like literally anywhere goodreads um let us know what our next book should be we will be we've still got two more weeks of dune but then we're dipping our toes into some more books. So let us know what you think. Thank you so much for joining us and we will see you next week. Farewell. Bye.